Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Ryan Foy. Hey, Ryan, how are you doing? I'm good, Maddie. How are you today? I am doing great. Thank you. To give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background on you, Ryan Foy is an author, speaker, and entrepreneur who is passionate about personal growth, education, and well-being. He's the owner of Foy Consulting, which aims to help people and small organizations move from good to great. His latest book, How to Thrive in Remote Working Environments, recently hit number one on Amazon in Canada and cracked the top 40 books on entrepreneurship worldwide. Ryan owns a digital publication called The Canadian Way. And we're going to be talking today about what writers can learn from remote workers, the best practices of remote workers. And so, Ryan, I thought it made sense to start right out and ask you what was going on in your own life that led you to take on the study of what writers can learn from remote workers as an area of interest? Yeah, great question, Maddie, and welcome to all the listeners tuning in today. So just to paint a bit of a picture here on that book, it's my third book, and I always knew I was going to write another one. And just like all of the folks listening in and and pretty much everybody around the world, when COVID-19 hit in the spring of 2020, my job went fully remote and it seemed to be every industry. It was healthcare, education, obviously business, pretty much every job was going remote. And as that spring and summer went along, I started doing some research on what's out there to support the well-being of remote workers. And of course, writers fall into that category very often. What's out there to support their well-being? And there wasn't much. There was a couple of books out there. There was one by Jason Fried, who has a really good book called Remote. It was dated, I think it was 2014, 2015. But anyway, there wasn't much out there. And so I decided maybe there's an opportunity now to write based on what I'm experiencing, being now a full-time remote worker. And if there's ways that I can support other folks out there to advocate for their well-being, to support their well-being, I want to be able to do that. And so it's funny, it was December of that year, so December of 2020, and I went to Eastern Canada to visit my family for the holidays. And I was actually staying at my sister's house and you had to do the 14 day quarantine back then. And I joked that I channeled my inner Mark Twain because at one point I'm literally sitting there, I think it was like day four of my quarantine writing this manuscript and there's deer in the backyard, the snow's falling and there's two cats sitting on my lap. And I'm like, where's Mark Twain? <laughs> this is every writer's dream, right? To be isolated and quiet and creative and Anyway, so during the quarantine is when I wrote the manuscript and then produced it the following spring. Um, and it's kind of gone from there. So that was a little bit about ethos of it. It was really just, it just formed into, a, you know, there's a gap, there's a need, needs to be filled. And how can I use my skills and expertise to help fill that? So what were a couple of things that you found were standing in good stead as a remote worker that you found you could translate to your work as a writer? I've been very blessed over the years to have the opportunity to read a lot of books. And when a lot of these personal growth, personal development books talk about boundaries, right? They talk about setting goals and achieving your goals and things like that. And so for me over the years, I've been really clear in terms of trying to make sure I set boundaries with work, with hobbies, with side hustles, being an entrepreneur as well. And so that really translated very easily into the writing process, being able to take off one hat and put on another something that I was kind of familiar with through uh, remote working gigs and running a business and working full time. So I was able to leverage that and channel that to really accelerate the process. And the other thing too, that really helped me was, and I know you've had some amazing experts on the show talk about this too, but just the writing process as a whole, having gone through that with two other books prior to this one, I was able to accelerate certain processes and I was able to really keep an eye on things like the editing process making sure I made lots of space for that. And then also just not compromising on things I might have compromised on earlier in my writing career. So making sure the cover was really well done, the interior design had all the elements that I wanted, things like that. So I really kind of leveraged a lot of things I've read over the years, a lot of things I've instilled in my life and just put it all together and made it work. What were you doing when COVID hit and quarantine became a thing, what had you been doing up till then? Were you in a more traditional non-remote work environment? I had been working remote, but only part-time. And I'd been doing that on and off for, I think, six years, seven years prior to COVID-19. So I was familiar with it and I'd worked abroad and worked for companies all over the world. But in terms of the full-time, I was in a full-time office setting, open office setting. 
And so it was quite abrupt to go literally, I'm sure listeners can think about this day too, but it was like the day the NBA canceled their game, the NHL canceled the game. And it was like the cascade effect across North America, at least on that day. I think it was like March 12th or something, but yeah. So similar for me, I went from this open office full time to now, okay, you're working not just 10 hours a week remote. You're now you're working 40 to 50 hours a week remote. And so it was just quite a shift, right? And that, that is just quite a lot for anybody to tackle. And so I thought like many, it's just going to be temporary. This will just be a month and everything will blow over. And, you know, here we are two and a half years later and it's still rolling. Yeah. It was definitely a, a quite a tectonic shift. And and with where I'm at too, I'm, I'm located in Canada. It's still a really new thing. A lot of parts of Canada don't have great access to internet. So access is an issue. Um, and a lot of organizations are structured so that people do come into the office. And so it's quite a fairly new concept. And I, I think a lot of employers, at least were looking to bigger companies, maybe in the US for some of that uh, kind of wise practices around it. But I think now we're in a different place in, in terms of it's more accepted, it's more common, and it's more based on the needs and the skill set of the workers that you have. One of the things you had mentioned was the idea of boundaries. And I think that's so tricky because when people were going into an office or going to their place of work, there's this obvious physical division between their work location and their non-work location. And oftentimes, I know this is true for me, other people I've spoken with, using that commute time to decompress either ramp up from home to work or calm down from work to home or vice versa, depending on what your life is like. And I think that for a lot of people, remote work has been very difficult because there isn't that obvious boundary, but it's almost exacerbated for writers because a lot of writers are holding down a full-time job and writing. So there are kind of three sets of boundaries they have to try to manage. There's the day job boundaries, there's the personal life boundaries, and then there's the writing boundaries. Does that sound true to you? And if it does, how have you dealt with that yourself? And how do you recommend people deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're spot on, Maddie. I think that, especially right now in the current times that we're in, people are juggling multiple realities and it's tough. It's not easy. I got a few grays for anybody watching the YouTube video that have come from this, but I think a couple of things that come to mind for me that have worked really well. And my wife and I, we live in a small apartment, so it's okay. How do you shift from work mode to writing mode to being a husband in the home mode? It's very, very difficult. But one of the the things I write about and one of the things I've done in in my life is what are the small psychological triggers that you can build into your routines and into your days that can help you close one mindset and maybe open another? And so for me, one of them is I have this lamp on my desk and uh, at the end of the workday, as soon as the lamp clicks, it's like a psychological trigger for me to turn off from work mode and to go to where I'm going to go next. So whether that's cooking dinner, whether that's going for a walk, whether that is doing some writing or working on my business, I know that I've closed off one part of my day and I can start another. So that's been a really nice way for me to set those boundaries. And it's funny because that can be anywhere. You could turn off the lamp in a hotel room. You could turn off a lamp at the office. So figuring out what that trigger is for you and and replicating that in whatever environments you find yourself in, I think can be really helpful. It's been really helpful for me. And the second thing I think is the world is moving very fast. And as writers, things are moving very fast. What's the next book coming out? What's the next thing? And we get caught in that a lot. And one of the things that we've done in our home is try to, we know that creativity needs boundaries and structure creates freedom. And so what we've done as well is every Sunday we do nothing. (laughs) So there's no writing, no work, no business, no nothing. So we at least take space for one day to recharge before we get back into the speed of things. Because the majority, like you say, Maddie, of people are wearing a lot of hats and it's exhausting and you need to rejuvenate those creative juices as best you can week to week for sure. This is sounding appealing to me. And for a while, I tried to take Fridays off. haha. <laughs> and then it turned out to be that I wasn't really taking it off, but at least I was trying to keep it free of meetings. But it's an interesting spin because in the same way that a writer is juggling perhaps personal life and day job and writing, I think indie authors are also juggling two hats. One is as a 
creator and one is as a business person. And my husband at one time made the completely shocking suggestion that I just spend a week and not do any work. <laughs> and I said, that would be so stressful for me. Not so much from a creative point of view, because I think I would still be writing in my head, even if I wasn't sitting at a keyboard. But that idea of the work side of things building up would be way more stressful to me than just dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Any thoughts or suggestions there? Yeah, that's a great point. And one of the things I've had to come to grips with recently, because you're absolutely right, is as an author, you're not only an author and a creator, you're sometimes your own business owner. And the books alone can be your business. And one of the things I've had to do recently is just realize my limitations that I just can't do everything. And you get emails from this company saying, promote your book here, or somebody refers you here. And even podcasts, I've created a flow that works for me, jumping on different shows. I've had people come to me and say, oh, Ryan, you should be on a show every week. But I just can't handle that. I just can't handle that level of output with my books and my business. And so what I've done is I found a kind of a flow that works for me. And that's one time a month, I jump on one podcast like yours. And back to not being able to do everything, I've had to let go of contracts with bookstores, smaller bookstores. As an indie author, we all know, right? It's very challenging. It's very hard just to get your name out there to get the books moving. But I've had to move away from smaller markets and focus on just one or two larger markets because I just can't manage everything. Bootstrapping the accounting, bootstrapping promotion, marketing, it's a lot. And at the end of the day, you got to keep your sanity through the whole thing, right? And it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I've learned that some hard ways, but I think it's a constant juggle. And it's just a matter of being, it's okay to say no. And it's okay to focus on some of these maybe larger outputs and to not always be doing, maybe just to step back and say, okay, you know what? I am going to tone down this frequency or I am going to maybe tone down where I'm at in all these markets. So I know it's tough. And I'm very privileged because I'm not going to starve if I don't sell a book. I have my full-time job and I know every author is in a different place, but I think if you can find a balance that works for you and focus on the bigger outputs, I think that's a win for sure. Yeah. At some point I'm going to collect all the times a guest has talked about the value of, I've heard them express it as not doing anything, but I think it really is not scheduling anything, either calendar type scheduling or just mental virtual scheduling. So go for a walk, not, not with the idea that I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to listen to a podcast, or I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to think about the next chapter of my book. No, just go for a walk. And I think that it's a response to how overscheduled and overstimulated our lives can be that so many people have suggested that. And I know usually twice a year, my husband and I vacation in Maine. We live in Philadelphia. Well, my husband's a pilot, so he can fly. But I've been driving because the rental cars are so expensive. It's just worth it to have our own car up there. And a couple of times I've done that 12-hour drive with no radio, no podcast, nothing going on, no audiobooks playing or anything like that. I've just driven. And it's been so therapeutic, <laughs> honestly. So that management of mental energy and giving yourself some downtime is important. And I know energy management is one of the things you particularly focus on. Are there other tips you have about energy management that writers can learn from remote workers? Yeah, great point. And, uh, and you're absolutely right, Maddie. And I think for authors out there listening, finding what works for you, what's going to rejuvenate you. For me, that, un that kind of unstructured thinking time, just being present with myself is when I run. And you know, I know I, I, episode 129 with Mike Kuxala, he's big on standing and movement breaks and things like that as well. And I think movement's a really healthy thing for authors. But in terms of the energy management, that's something I talk about quite a bit in the book. And I think at the time, and it speaks to really what we're talking about today, Maddie, is that there's, the, the world is moving fast and things are coming at us fast and decisions are having to be made very fast. And sometimes we to slow that down and really do an audit in terms of where is our energy going each day, what's filling us and what's taking away from us. And that's something I talk about. I provide an energy audit questionnaire in the book where authors, entrepreneurs, remote workers can ask themselves those questions. And what it does is it takes you from self-awareness into action. And the action part is where I write about what I call my five-step energy amplifier blueprint 
where you do this audit, you have the self-awareness in terms of where your energy is going each day. And then the blueprint is broken down into each section of the day. And it's broken down into a series of questions that you can ask yourself and actions that you can take to remain in this thriving state uh, throughout your day. And you replicate these things, you tailor it to you, you maybe you tweak a question here or you add an action or remove an action or whatever it is. But the blueprint is really designed just to help people ask themselves those questions through each part of their day to help re remain in this state where they can be at their optimal performance in terms of writing, or if they're doing Canva creation and, and design, doing high level design, things like that. We just can't do that for eight or 10 hours a day. It's very, very hard. And we need to really build some structure around that. Some other tips that I typically mention, and I do mention this in the blueprint as well, is sleep hygiene is huge. A dark room, typically a little bit cooler than the other rooms in your house. Putting the phone in a separate room uh, is really helpful. So sleep hygiene is critical in our home. We're really big on that. And also uh, drinking 150 mils of water first thing in the morning is something that I advocate quite a bit. It's really great. Uh, and moving 30 to 60 minutes a day it doesn't have to be Peloton class or anything like that. Just getting out and walking can, can be great. And those are the three biggest things that I've seen. And the other thing I would say too is planning your pre-day routine, I guess, the night before. And I know we're talking a lot about planning and structure, but you know, if you can visualize what your morning is going to look like as you're ending one day, it might put you in a better place in the morning. For example, a lot of times people, I've heard stories of people will set out their workout gear the night before. So when they get up in the morning, they don't have to even think about it. They don't have to, okay, where's my shorts? Where's my headband? Where's, it's already out. So you just can go on autopilot, put on what you need to put on to go outside for that 30 minute walk or whatever. So I think those can be some really helpful tips for folks. And especially as we get into the winter, for sure. I think one of the things that changed a little bit when people move to more remote work is having more autonomy over how they manage their day. And this is sort of related to energy management in the sense that if we're just looking at the indie author life and setting aside for a moment, the ideas of having a day job and having a personal life, there's the creative work you have to do and there's the business work you have to do. And I have tried different approaches to how to optimize that for myself. So as an example, if I could go back and have lunch with all the people I worked with in my corporate life, one of the things I tell them is how much time corporate employees lose by task switching. And I try to have a focus for my day. So Mondays is podcast day. And I don't even expect to do any writing because I know that I'm going to be recording a podcast, preparing a podcast, doing podcast administrative stuff. And Friday, to the extent I work, is only going to be writing work. Are there any tips that you have that people can use to optimize their own approach to how they assign themselves tasks as they go through that indie author life? Yeah, absolutely. I really like what you've done there, Maddie, in terms of a, a thematic approach to your days. One of the things that I like to really do, and I can't take credit for this, I learned this from a writer on the Medium platform. His name is escaping me, but the concept is brilliant. And I use it in my writing, in my business, and my full-time work. And it's called contextual scheduling. So basically, say you know, maybe you're working on multiple books right now. So Say it's book one, you want to, you do your best writing three to four hours into the writing process. So in whatever calendar you use, whether it's a hardcover version or a digital version, you just block that in your calendar and it could just be writing XX book. It doesn't need to be a full day, but if you know your peak writing time is say 9am to 1pm in the afternoon, and you know that you know, instead of setting a, a goal of being like, I want to get this chapter done or this chapter done, just blocking that time and then being okay with what you achieved in that time. So maybe you only got a third of the way as far as you wanted to go, but it was really rich, really deep writing. That can be just as great versus, okay, I need to bang out this chapter. I need to do this podcast or I need to do this. So that's something that I've learned. It works really well, I find especially when things are more agile. Say you're writing a book where you're interviewing people. And so you got to grab these interviews and these forwards and book blurbs and everything that's coming into the book. You may set aside 
uh, a block of time to do that and then just set a reoccurring so every week you're doing those tasks at, the, at that specific time versus other times where your best energy is put into the writing and the creation process and just blocking that with uh, contextual scheduling yeah another sort of i think related topic is the idea of recognizing and mitigating distractions uh, certainly a challenge that both writers and remote workers share any thoughts on that topic yeah absolutely <clears throat> i wrote about that in, in my book because there was going from an open office to working remotely full-time there was this, this kind of misconception floating around that there's no distractions but in reality there's a lot of distractions in the home right and there's a lot of distractions at the local coffee shop and so what i do is i talk about recognizing those distractions so at home sometimes now we're dealing with the amazon delivery person that comes by we're dealing with the pets that are at your feet wanting to go outside for a walk every hour uh, you're dealing with potentially kids at one point, right? When schools were closed down. So, okay, there's distractions, something spilled in the kitchen. So what I do is these distractions, as we know, as writers can take us out of that writing space, can take us out of what it is that we're doing, right? It can be really distracting to us. And we also know, I think I read somewhere recently that it takes 12 minutes to get back into the thought, the deep thought process you were in once you've been distracted and pulled out of it. So really it can be inefficient, right? And so I talk about that in the book. How can you just recognize these distractions, write them out. So I give the space, okay, write out what are the things you think are going to happen or that are going to pop up in your days, in your schedule, and how can you mitigate those? So for example, today I'm doing this recording out of a hotel room and I was thinking ahead about the distractions that will probably pop up. And I actually asked them if I could have a room at the end of the hallway. So I'm not near the elevator, not near any noise. And behind me, there's no one behind this wall. So just thinking about these things and just recognizing that distractions are going to happen. They're going to be, they're real. But you know, if we're going to continue to be in this thriving state, whether it's in our writing, whether it's in our creation process and the work that we do, recognizing distractions are going to be real. And then thinking through how each of us can mitigate those as we go through our weeks. And we were talking before we started recording about the fact that I have three dogs, one of one of which is a puppy, and the puppy was unhappy a little while ago. And I have two rooms I use as an office, this room, which is where I do my podcast recording, basically. And then I have a room that's right off the kitchen where I spend most of my time and uh, the dogs are there. And I'm always surprised, you know, if I come up here, I spent the day in this office because I had uh, two podcast interviews and I had to do podcast editing. So I thought I'll just settle in in the podcast room and I get so much work done. And I think, I wonder why that is. And then I realize it's because I didn't get up 17 times to let the dogs in or out or get them water or whatever, pet them or whatever the other things are. Yeah, finding a way to manage your environment, I think is really important. And the other thing that I wanted to get back to, I wanted to loop back to something you had said very early on, which was the idea you were the Mark Twain, you were there at your sister's house over the holidays with the cat looking across the snow dappled landscape or what have you. And that I think early on, this idea of being able to nest and stay home, especially for writers, whether you're a full-time writer or not, was very appealing, but pretty soon it palls. And I think there are a lot of people, again, this is comparable in the remote worker. I think there are a lot of people who are really looking forward to getting back to work because they really miss that interaction. And I'm going to use as an entree to this, the fact that before we started talking, you mentioned that, you know, Mike Kuzala, who was in episode 129, Moving for Creativity. And that you were talking about how exciting it was to be able to meet him at a conference. And I think a lot of people are missing the interactions. So in the same way that I think some people who are working remotely now permanently are having to find other ways to get the energy that you can really only get from interacting with other people. Do you have any tips for writers who are also feeling that need? Yeah, absolutely, Maddie. And this is one of the things that I talk about quite a bit in the book. And I talk about Two things. First, we need to acknowledge that loneliness is a real thing and anxiety is a real thing. I've given myself I've given myself a pass for a year coming out of COVID-19 that I'm going to be okay being socially awkward. I'm not going to be hard on myself for a year because I spent two years writing, 
am really talking to no one except through a screen and my wife who, who lives with me. So first of all, giving yourself permission to be awkward. It's okay. No one is going to judge you. Be, go okay. Be easy on yourself. I think that's first and foremost. So second, I have to ask before you go to the second thing, in what ways do you see that social awkwardness playing out? Yeah, so I'm a pretty extroverted person. And what I've realized is now I'm kind of a hybrid. I'm more introvert and extrovert, depending on the context. Um, but I find I'm more, I'm more awkward at like conferences, bigger events. I'm better in smaller groups. Whereas in the past, you get me out in front of a stage and I could talk to anybody. Whereas now I like, I want to be around a bonfire. I want to talk. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely, I, that was almost what I was going to write about my next book was embracing my post-pandemic self. But then I was like, no one's going to read that. <laughs> but I'm definitely, I, I imagine we're all a little bit different. And for me, I'm definitely a little bit different. Yeah, for sure. I like that idea of not comparing how you're operating with how you operated before COVID or before any major moment in your life or period in your life that you have to assess. I like that you keep looping back to the idea of the contextual situation that you assess what you're comfortable with or where you want to focus your energy based on where you are now, not where you think you should have been two years ago or three years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that COVID really brought out this idea that we are social beings by nature. And early on, it was, it had to be, what was it? It was like physical distance. And then they changed it to socially distance, right? Yeah. And it's like, but what does that mean? And coming back to it now, I think it's important to remember that we are social beings and we also can't, we can't confuse communication with connection. Like we can communicate all day over email or whatnot, but this is real connection, you and I on this conversation. And I think in our remote settings or as authors, making sure that we're being intentional about the community around us, plugging into that community as best we can, even if it's small, even if it's just one element of that community. That's really important for our well-being, but also making space for pure connection. And that sometimes has no hidden agenda. There's really no structure. It could be just getting out and walking with somebody, going to a coffee shop, talking to a stranger, maybe striking up a conversation with somebody on the bus. I think these are important things because loneliness was one of the largest concerns that came out when looking at data with remote workers and what they're struggling with. And this was in 2020, 2021. But loneliness and anxiety were the two highest ones. And so I think it's important that we make space for that. And thank you for that, Maddie, because for folks out there, say community is huge. Communication is one thing, but making sure to have space in your life for good connection, even if that's with a few select people, is really important for your writing, for your well-being, and to inspire new ideas and to bounce ideas off of the community. I think it's really important. Great. Well, all right. I think that's a perfect note to wrap up on. And I want to thank you for sharing your thoughts about what writers can learn from remote workers. And please let the listeners and viewers know where they can find out more about you and all you do online. Yeah. Thanks, Maddie. So you can check me out on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at wellnessrf. And also my website is just foyconsulting.org. I'm happy to continue the conversation with folks. Love to connect with other writers here what's good, what's not so good. And thanks again to your listeners for listening in. This has been awesome. Great. Thank you.